This is Arlen Rabinowitz for RedGiantTV.com. So far, we're about, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds in, and already this is one of my favorite episodes of all time. You see, normally I work with the post end of things, after stuff is shot and handed off, and sometimes the stuff I'm given really isn't all that usable, mostly because people say, ah, crud, ah, well, they'll fix that in post. Well, I've had enough of that. In this episode of Red Giant TV, we're joined by filmmaker and director Eric Escobar. Now, Eric Escobar was a member of the Final Cut Pro development team at Apple from 2001 to 2003, so he knows his way around video technology. And he's directed commercials for Sony, Intel, HP, and Visa. And at the same time, he's also an independent filmmaker whose works have won acclaim at Sundance. Recently, Eric Escobar gave a presentation at the Slamdance Film Festival where he discussed the entire production process from scouting locations to casting to lighting to filming and finally to the technology used to take all of that and make it look better. But most importantly, he talked about how you need to plan for that technology in all of the steps that come before it. Now, we at Red Giant Software went along for that ride, and by we, I mean not me, who was stuck in my office in New York, by the way, while other people were living it up and mingling with the independent film industry's up-and-coming movers and shakers. And I think I lost my point here. Right, and uh, anyway, we went out there with Eric and recorded this presentation just for Red Giant TV. So, take it away, Eric. Hey, this is Eric Escobar uh, here at the Slamdance 2009 Film Festival, and I'm about to give a talk to uh, Slamdance filmmakers and other folks around here about how to make a life while making a living being a 21st century hyphenate techno filmmaker. I'm going to talk now about technology, um, and it's my philosophy of technology. It's important to um, to think about the technology. One, not necessarily to, to, uh, to dismiss it, right? But also to think about like what, how it can help you as a filmmaker, like free yourself, all right? And to embrace it. Um, what does it take to make a cinematic image? This is a Red Rock Micro. And this is a Canon HV20. And this is an upside down uh, ICANN monitor. And on the front here is a 50 millimeter Nikon lens from 1968 that I got off Craigslist for like, you know, 60 bucks. And why? Well, the technology helps us create cinematic images. The technology, the, the image you put up on the screen is, is a, a product of the technology you use to create the image. The 20, 24P first showed up on the um, DVX100. And actually, Stu and the people at the orphanage had a lot to do with that. And they were taken backstage at NAB, um, and they were shown the, the DVX100 from the Panasonic engineers, and it was really cool, it had all the stuff they liked, and they were like, well, what's, what's missing? And they just said, well, 24 frames. Like, we want to shoot video that's 24 frames a second, not 30. Because 30 frames per second is a visual aesthetic that we all associate with television. 24 frames per second is what we associate with film. There's a lot of, like, psychobabble theory that goes on about, like, brain waves emitted at 24p versus 30p. I'm not going to get into that. Who knows? Maybe it's true. But film looks like film at 24 frames. Video looks like video at 30 frames. 30 frames is the evening news. 24p is good fellas, right? The cameras have that. These little teeny tiny cameras now. Now everybody's camera is, you know, it's, 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 it's ubiquitous. Um, that's what Magic Bullet started. Magic Bullet started not as looks, not as cinematic looks, but it started as a way to take your 30 frame video, 60 field video, and convert it into 24 progressive frames a second to mimic the look of film. Okay, to actually make it 24 frames. Now all the cameras do that, um, and so Magic Bullet does something else. Then the next thing is these color tools. This is this is what Magic Bullet looks looks like. And color grading, the color grading or color timing, um, is this process. The films that you see and the television you see on the screen, the way the color looks is um, as much a product of what's done uh, in the editing suite as what's done in production. 
in, for, with an eight hundred dollar camcorder, some lenses you buy off Craigslist, you know, an eight hundred dollar lens adapter. Uh, suddenly, you're shooting images with a tiny, you know, uh, vacation video camera that looks like a movie, and that's the thing. You want to make your movie look like a movie. My one rule about this is just don't rely on presets for your color correction. At first, it's fine. It's good to use these presets because then you get a sense. But you do want to like start learning what color means. Color means something. Uh, a canned look effect is not the same as the look of your movie. Plugins give you all kinds of cool color power, but it's only one part of the look of your movie. Okay? The look is determined by what you put in front of the lens, and that's what Akira Kurosawa said, make it the best that you can in front of the lens, and then think about afterwards, okay? So what you put in front of the lens, the people, the locations, the props, the costumes, how those elements are shot, lighting, camera movement, um, computer graphics, what kind of color grading or effects are applied in post-production. You're in charge of everything that goes on in front of the lens and behind the keyboard. Um, you have to understand the technology, uh, while also mastering the elements of story, you have to light and compose a good shot while also catching the difference between a great performance and bad acting. Um, and nothing can really actually be fixed in post. You can't really rely on technology to fix something that you screwed up in production. This is, a good, this is good news, though, because you don't have to wait. You can learn all this stuff, and you can get the technology, and you can put the groups of people together to do it. You don't have to wait for anything. Um, so here's what I do. Uh, in the meantime, since I'm not in film school, and since I don't always get to, to do um, the stuff that I want to be doing, I like to deconstruct. And this is a game I play, I play with my friends called Making the Shot. And in Making the Shot, you um, are stealing back what the factory has stolen from us. Okay, You reverse engineer the look of a movie or TV show. Right? So you pick a favorite TV show, or just a TV show, a popular TV show, or a movie, which you can easily now download. Oh my god, how many places can you get a movie or a TV show? Download it, rip it to your hard drive, rip from iTunes, Hulu, Netflix, or you know, a television. Um, and then you go ahead and you start grabbing frames from the show of the key signature things, like the locations they use, their actors, like their lighting, their color. Like what are the key things? How do they put together, and then you put together your own lookbook, you reverse engineer the shots. Um, and you analyze the shots, the compositions, and you figure out the rules and the language of the show. Every one of these shows or movies, especially episodic television, has rules for how they, they, they say things. Um, and then you figure out how to recreate that look for no money, or for no more than whatever you can spare, 40, 50 bucks, just using what you have. Okay, so, so here's the thing that most people do when they use the look plugins or when they use any kind of color correction is they think about this stuff after the fact. Like they don't go into production with these rules in mind. They're like, we'll just, the color is, the guy in the color correction suite will make it look cool. It's a bad idea to do that. This is Mark Christensen. Okay, we're going to put a little spotlight on his face with Colorista. All right. And then we're going to make him evil blue. This is kind of a smurfy blue, but, you know, it's pretty evil blue. Uh, and then we're going to, like, use a gradient to try and make a, like, a side key light. Okay? And then we're going to put on a swing tilt filter. <laughs> and then, well, we should make it nighttime. Okay. So it's just mud. So, what went wrong? Well, one, is there anything menacing or evil about this man? A little bit. He's kind of too bald. I don't know. He's got these lines there. He's wearing a hood. Um, are any of our evil telecopter rules followed here? Well, no, we're not close up enough. What should we have done instead? We should have... Well, there's no single answer, okay? Um, to, how to decide the right way is, is why you need to know all of your options, okay? You need to sort of weigh what you can do in camera versus what you're going to do in post. But it's a conscious choice. Okay. When you know all your options, then you decide where to allocate your non-existent resources um, and come up with a plan. Draw pictures. I mean, this is all rudimentary. I know you guys are filmmakers. You draw pictures. Drawing pictures is good. I draw pictures because it helps me figure out where my resources are going to be, and what, what shot needs what, and come up with a list. Um, 
make a list of everything you need. We need an evildoer telepath, dressed appropriately. We need an exterior night location, secluded and filled with dread, lit to enhance the dread. I like to shoot night for night. I don't like shooting day for night. Casting. So we've got Mark, our visual, you know, our awesome visual effects artist. And then we've got my friend Nick here, who's a local actor in San Francisco who just came off of a string of roles where he played a heroin addict <coughs> for like three movies in a row. He was like, he was like the junkie. And so he's still in junkie mode. Look at this guy. You know? So who's going to look a little more menacing when he's lit properly? You know, they both could, everybody looks menacing when lit properly. But, but we, we'll use Nick. We'll go with Nick. All right? Wardrobe. Okay? This is not scary. Right? Contem you know, it's, uh, it's the Venom costume you can buy online. So, pick a costume that reflects some light. I know it's a shadowy figure, but don't dress your actors in black. Black clothing does not reflect light. And if you don't have a lot of resources, you do need everything, you do want everything in the frame to actually reflect some light so that there's detail. There's no detail in the shadows, it just crunches and there's nothing there. So even though it's like this sort of gray jacket, when you throw him in a shadowed area, there's still some detail here, okay? Create that silhouette in post. Don't try to create it in camera. Okay. Location. Here's three locations. The train tracks by the docks in Oakland at night. Kind of scary. Uh, this alleyway over in Alameda. Not that scary, but, but sort of interesting and menacing. And then there's Vince, who is my crew. I have this me and Vince with the whole crew. And this is uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, yard or the sort of driveway between Vince's house and his neighbor's house. Um, who he's really good friends with. What am I going to pick? <laughs> I'm going to go with the side of Vince's house on this one. Even though it's not necessarily like the dreamy perfect location for my shot, it allows me to do stuff. One, I can have electricity without a generator. Um, I get to have uh, his really wonderful family. They're nice and supportive because he's a filmmaker too. He just shot a feature for like 10 grand in his neighborhood. It's a really cool, scary feature. And um, his neighbors are super cool and they won't call the cops on us, which is always a bonus not to have the police call on your shoot. So and then you light it up, okay, following the rules. We have one 1K Omni. We have a couple of 650 Fresnels that I've just picked up a few lights here and there. And then we have two practical lights, right? Just like, you know, light bulbs that we hung up here to put the light in the background. Um, and then we just have a bounce card. So here's the original image. This is what it looks like at a camera. So this is Nick there. We've got the scary uh, hood. Um, we've got these lights in the background there, these practical lights that really aren't really lighting up anything. He's being lit with a, with a 650. The garage is being lit with a, this 1K. And, and then we're, you know, he's getting some side bounce off the, the, um, the alley. And that's running it through the denoising plugin that's in Magic Bullet Steady, which removes the artifacting. Because again, we're shooting to uh, an HD compressed format, so that adds these little, you know, artifacting and noise to the image. Um, and this denoiser gets rid of it. It's, it's a slight softening, but again, it gets rid of it. We do a power window with Colorista, bring a space out. And then we go into looks, Magic Bullet looks, and we start building a look. Well, we're going to go ahead and bump up the exposure overall. We're going to apply this like pro misty diffusion on it. We're going to run this like uh, bleach bypass simulation. We're going to crush it. And we're going to crush it evil blue. And then we're going to just a film curve and then run an auto shoulder. And boom, we get a little waveform. We see that we have pushed stuff down here into the shadows, but we had stuff to push down there. We got to decide in post where to crush. Okay, that's really powerful. And we got to decide where we were going to have detail. We have detail here, we have detail there, all right? And there's the final look. You know, the space is brought out, boom, boom. This look didn't cost anything. So before, after. Before, after. You see, we've thrown away parts of the image, right? But we're selective about it to create this look. Thanks, Eric. I've watched this presentation a couple of times already, and it's full of great advice. 
There are a few things in there that I've learned the hard way. And my suggestion to you is to get anyone you're working with on a film project to watch the presentation so that they can look at the bigger picture before having to say things like, Ah, crud. Well, we'll fix that in post. If you want to keep up with Eric Escobar and his thoughts on film and production, check out his blog at prepshootpost.blogspot.com. And you can also see his work at contentfilms.com. That's spelled with a K. Now, just for watching this episode, we're going to give you a discount on any and all things Magic Bullet. So that means anything in the Magic Bullet product line, but only if you promise to think about the technology before you film. Go to redgiantsoftware.com forward slash promos to get this and other special Red Giant TV deals. Now, these are time-sensitive discounts. They won't last forever. All coupon codes expire seven days from the launch date of each episode. So again, go to redgiantsoftware.com forward slash promos to get the coupon codes for the most current Red Giant TV discounts. Once again, I'm Aaron Rabinowitz for redgianttv.com. See you next time.